It is important for those who are seeking for the mercies of God to see that appropriating faith is taking and using what God offers to us. Hope is expecting a blessing sometime in the future, but faith is taking it right now, taking what God offers. We are to believe what God says He has done for us and act upon it, taking our blood-bought liberty just as the slaves of the South did after the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. The Gospel is a worldwide Emancipation Proclamation of liberty from service and bondage to the old tyrant master of sin and sickness, the devil. When Jesus said, It is finished, He meant that the work was done, completed as God sees it. God expects us to reckon as done what Jesus said was done. The past tenses of God's word mean a settled, sealed, and final decision of His will. In Galatians 3.13 we read, Christ hath, notice the tense, past tense, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. God has put our redemption from the curse of the law in the past tense, and we receive our deliverance when we do the same. In Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, we see that the curse of the law includes all diseases. In God's word we read, Surely he hath, past tense, borne our sicknesses and carried our pain. Himself took, past tense, our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, by whose stripes ye were healed. God wants us all to appropriate the past tenses of his word regarding his redemption of our souls and bodies from sickness and disease. He wants us to go forth in obedience, acting as if we believed him. When God puts a promise in the past tense, he thus authorizes and expects us to do the same. Nothing short of this is appropriating faith. In Mark 11.24, Jesus authorizes us and commands us to put the receipt of the blessing we pray for in the past tense. He says, when we ask for what he offers, Believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. We are to continue to believe that God gave us what we ask for when we prayed and continue to praise and thank Him for what He has given us. It is after we believe we have received what we ask for, after we believe He has heard our prayer, that God goes to work. Then the imperishable seed, His word, begins to grow. The farmer has to get the sowing of his seed into the past tense before it's possible to reap a harvest. The receiving of God's word, the imperishable seed, must be in the good ground of our heart, thus getting it into the past tense before the seed can begin its work. Believing that God has already heard our prayer before the blessing is manifested is the soil in which the imperishable seed, His word, grows and bears fruit. Believing that God has heard our prayer gets the seed into the ground, and then, and not before, it goes to work. Jesus at the grave of Lazarus said while Lazarus was still dead, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. The sick who pray for healing are to say before the healing materializes, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. The prayer of faith is believing our prayer is heard before the answer materializes, before the answer is manifested. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. It is before having experienced or being conscious of any change whatsoever that faith rejoices and says, It is written. When we ask for healing, we are to say on the authority of God's word, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Faith refuses to see as reason for doubting anything contrary to the word of God. It sees health and strength bequeathed to us, already belonging to us because of the death of the testator. By his death, the will is in force. Jesus says to us, As thou hast believed, past tense, so be it unto thee. With our natural eyes, we see only the temporal and inferior things of earth. But with the enlightened eyes of our understanding, we behold the superior, satisfying, and lasting realities of God's spiritual and eternal kingdom. 
God said to Abraham, A father of many nations have I made thee. Notice it's in the past tense. Since God put this promise in the past tense, Abraham did the same. He acted his faith by taking his new name, Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. A man put a certain amount of money in the pocket of his wife's coat, telling her he had done so and asking her if she believed him. She replied, Certainly I do, and began to plan how she would spend it. She actually had this money before she saw it. Why should we believe the bare word of others and demand proof from God? If someone should deed you a home that you have never seen, you actually have a home before you see it. Faith is the evidence or title deed of things not yet seen. A deed makes a home so much yours that you can sell it without ever seeing it. Faith is believing you have what God says you have and acting accordingly before you either feel or see that you have it. God said to Joshua, See, I have delivered into thy hand Jericho. Joshua and his men put this victory in the past tense as God had done. The walls of Jericho fell flat while they were acting their faith. Jesus said to the ten lepers who asked for mercy, Go show thyselves unto the priest. His words unto them were as much as to say, I have given you my word, that it is done. They knew the law of the leper, and therefore what his command meant. And so they put their healing in the past tense before seeing it, and it was manifested while they were acting their faith. Jonah put his deliverance in the past tense, called his symptoms lying vanities, and sacrificed with the voice of thanksgiving while he was still in the stomach of the great fish. It worked. The reason thousands are not getting what they pray for is that they are keeping their blessing in the future tense, which is only hope. Faith takes the blessings now. Were the gifts of God for soul and body merely promised gifts, we would have to wait for the promiser to fulfill his promises. The responsibility would be on him. But all of God's blessings are offered gifts, as well as promised, and therefore need to be accepted. The responsibility for their transfer is ours. This clears God of all responsibility for any failures. The only reason you were not saved a year earlier than you were is that you did not take what God had provided and was offering to you. God was not making you wait. You were making Him wait. Some say, God will heal me in His own good time. This is only hope and not faith. Faith takes what God offers right now. Lesson 9 deals with the faith that takes. I'd like to read a passage of Scripture from Mark chapter 11, verse 24. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the evidence, or title deed, to things not seen. In Jeremiah, a title deed is repeatedly spoken of as the evidence. Your deed is the evidence or proof that you own your home. So faith is the title deed to what you have not yet seen. When you have been given a deed to a home which you have not yet seen, you already have a home before you see it. Jesus repeatedly said, He that believeth hath. Moffat's translation of Hebrews 11.1 1 reads, Faith means we are convinced that we have what we do not see. In Mark 11.24, Jesus commands us to believe we have received the things we pray for at the time we pray without waiting to see or feel them. He promises ye shall have them. Faith for the healing of your body, the same as faith for forgiveness, is to be believed on the authority of God's word that you were forgiven before you feel forgiven. Nothing else is faith, for faith is the evidence of things not seen. As soon as the blessing we take by faith is manifested, faith for that blessing ends. If you are the beneficiary of a rich man's will, you are already wealthy the moment the rich man dies, though you have not seen any of the money. In the same way, everything bequeathed to us in our Lord's last will and testament is already ours by virtue of the death of Jesus, the testator. Faith is simply using what belongs to us. In connection with healing, the same as with forgiveness, to believe we have received healing at the time we pray before seeing or feeling it, 
is the confidence of Hebrews 10, verse 35 and 36. The Holy Spirit tells us not to cast it away for the reason that it hath great recompense of reward. Peter tells us that it is the testing of this faith, the faith that we have received, which is more precious than gold. Believing that our prayer is granted at the time we pray, that we already have what we prayed for before we see it, is the confidence referred to in 1 John 5, verses 15 and 16. We know that we have the petition that we desire of him. The fig tree which Jesus cursed dried up, not from the leaves which could be seen, but from the roots which were out of sight. The death of the tree could not be detected at first by looking at the leaves. Calvary was our emancipation proclamation from everything outside the will of God. We are simply to believe what God says he has done for us and act upon it. We take our blood-bought liberty just as the slaves of the South did after the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. Suppose the slaves had judged by the evidence of the census, saying, I don't feel different. I can't see any change. All my surroundings are just the same as they were. Would that be faith? It was faith only when they acted on the freedom which was already theirs. In the same way, by believing and acting on the Word of God, everything that belongs to us in Christ becomes available at once. To accept any contrary physical evidence in preference to the Word of God is to nullify the Word as far as you are concerned. Faith is believing what God says in the face of contrary evidence to the senses. We are to be steadfast in resisting everything contrary to the Word of God. Faith means that we have left the sense realm. If a friend should deposit in the bank a hundred thousand dollars to your credit and bring you the passbook and a checkbook, you wouldn't examine your empty pocketbook to see how much money you have. You would examine your passbook. The Bible is the Christian's passbook. God has deposited in Christ all I need. It's already mine. To neglect it is not a proper attitude toward God. A right attitude toward God and His promises will bring about their fulfillment. You have to receive Christ before experiencing any of the wonderful results of receiving Him. Christ first, afterwards the results. We receive healing, divine life and strength, and every other promised blessing in exactly the same way we receive Christ and forgiveness. Since forgiveness is invisible, how do you receive it? Answer, by faith in God's Word. Why not receive divine healing and life and strength in the same way? Any blessing which is received by faith you must have before you see it, before it is manifested. Otherwise it would not be received by faith, which is the evidence of things not seen. The ten lepers already had healing in its unmanifested form when they started on their way to show the priests that they were healed. Their healing was manifested while they were acting their faith. God's announcement, I am the Lord that healeth thee, is to be received as the voice of God, believed as a present tense fact, and evaluated according to its cost. As perfume is non-existent to the sense of hearing, so what we take by faith, according to Mark 11.24, is at first non-existent to the five natural senses. You do not doubt the existence of what you see because you can't smell, taste, or hear it. Then why doubt the existence of what you have taken by faith, the sixth sense, because you can't see or feel it? The five natural senses belong to the natural man, who Paul tells us cannot know the things of God. It is only by our sixth sense, faith, that we can see and take and hold on to the blessings God offers to us until they are fully manifested. To consult our natural senses for evidence that our prayer has been granted is as ridiculous as trying to see with our ears or hear with our eyes. All of our six senses work independently of each other. You see what you can't hear. You hear what you can't see. Just so you have by faith what is at first non-existent to the natural senses. It is important to see that the contrary evidence of the senses is no reason for doubting because the evidence upon which faith rests are still perfect. It is faith only when we are believing in the face of the contrary evidence of the sensed. Abraham received and believed the word of God in the face of nature's evidence to the impossibility. You must already have perfume before you smell it. You must already have food before you can taste it. You must already have the healing before you can feel it. 
Faith receives forgiveness and healing and praises God for them when there is nothing as yet to praise him for, as far as the five senses can witness. Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, when the raising of Lazarus was yet in an unmanifested form. Just so, it is before we see or feel any change that we are to believe that our prayer for healing is granted. We are to say, as Jesus did, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. The angels at Dothan were already present before they became visible to the servant of Elisha. The ability God gave him to see those angels did not create them. God works while we maintain the mental habit of faith, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen, at God, at his promises, his faithfulness, and his justice. Faith has to do only with the unseen and unfelt. As soon as what we have taken by faith is manifested to the senses, it ceases to be faith. We must maintain the right mental attitude. No person who allows his mind to be ruled by his senses can have victorious faith. The mind that is ruled by the senses lives in a realm of uncertainty. Until God's word gains mastery over your mind, your mind will be swayed by feelings and by things you see or hear rather than by the word of God. The mind and thoughts of those seeking healing must be renewed so as to be brought into harmony with the mind of God as revealed in the Bible. Faith for God's promised blessings is the result of knowing and acting on God's word. The right mental attitude for the renewed mind makes steadfast faith possible to all. God always heals when he can get the right cooperation. I put a certain amount of money in Mrs. Bosworth's coat pocket and later told her, I asked her if she believed me. She said, of course I do, and thanked me for it. She actually had this money before she saw it. Why should we believe the word of others and demand visible proof from God? Continue to believe that God gave you what you asked for when you prayed, thanking and praising him for what he has given, and it will always materialize. This always puts God to work. So many are waiting for God to heal them. He is waiting for them to take what he is offering them. How trying it would be to a friend who offered you a gift for you to cry and beg for it, keeping him waiting for you to take it. Let me put this in another way. Jesus commands us to believe we have received the things that we prayed for at the time we prayed. Before they take visible form, it is clear that they exist in two forms. First, invisible. Afterwards, visible. First, believe that ye have received them in their invisible form and ye shall have them in their visible or material form. We have them first in the faith realm, afterwards in the sense realm. So Jesus in Mark 11.24 commands us as soon as we pray to believe that we have received in its invisible form what we pray for before he changes it into its visible or material form. The angels at Dothan were just as truly present and, and real in their invisible form as when they became visible to Elisha's servant. The ten lepers each had their healing in its invisible form while they were on their way to show the priest their healing in its visible and material form. When Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, the raising of Lazarus was complete in the faith realm before it was seen, a few moments later in the sense or material form. Just so, we are to believe that we already have our complete healing in its invisible form before God changes it into its visible or material form. The fact that faith is the evidence or title deed to things not seen proves that we must already have the things we pray for in their invisible form before God can change them into their visible or manifested form. The entire eleventh chapter of Hebrews records the actions of God's saints in the faith realm before the results of their faith took visible form. All the acts of faith are in the realm of the yet unseen. Believing that we have received the things we pray for at the time we pray is the confidence which is to be steadfast and unwavering until God changes the blessings we have taken from its invisible to its visible form. Walking by faith is walking by the kind of sight which sees and is occupied with eternal things, with God, with his promises, his faithfulness, and the many other perfect reasons for faith. It was believing without seeing that gave Peter joy unspeakable and full of glory. Nothing he had ever seen gave him as much joy as he now had by believing without seeing. The sacrifice of praise and the giving of thanks 
continually is done in the faith realm or before our blessings have been changed into their visible form. Jonah called his symptoms lying vanities and sacrificed with the voice of thanksgiving while he was still in the stomach of the great fish. The Israelites sang praises on their way to battle. Many people fail to receive what they pray for because of a lack of understanding about confession. In Hebrews 3.1, Christianity is called a confession. The Greek word here translated profession is the same as the one usually translated confession. What does it mean? This particular word in the Greek language means saying the same thing. It means to believe and say what God says about our sins, our sicknesses, and everything else included in our redemption. Confession is an affirmation of a Bible truth we have embraced. Confession is simply believing with our hearts and repeating with our lips God's own declaration of what we are in Christ. The Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 2.24 says, By his stripes ye were healed. We are to believe and say the same thing. When our affirmation is the word of God, he watches over it to make it good. Jeremiah 1.12 Confession is faith's way of expressing itself. In Hebrews 3.1 we are commanded to consider Christ Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. As our high priest, Jesus acts on our behalf according to what we confess, when it is in accordance with God's word. Paul tells us that he preached the word of faith, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10 verse 8. There is a relation of confession to manifestation. Notice here that the confession saying the same thing that God says is by faith. It is believing and confessing before experiencing the result. The confession comes first, and then Jesus, our high priest, responds with the new birth. It is not salvation unto confession, but confession unto salvation. Confession comes before salvation. There is no such thing as salvation without confession. Faith is acting upon God's word, and this always puts God to work fulfilling his promise. What are we to confess? Few Christians today have recognized the place confession holds in God's plan for our appropriation of his blessings. Whenever the word confession is used, many instinctively think of confessing sin or weakness and failure. This is only the negative side of this great question. Our negative confession of sin was only to open the way for the positive confession unto salvation, a way to a whole lifetime of blessing with our heart and saying with our lips everything that God says to us in His promises. We confess unto salvation in its initial form, and then in each of its successive forms, first in the form of the new birth, then in the form of every blessing promised to us in the Word of God. The Christian is to act on every phase of his salvation that he knows about. We are to believe with the heart and confess with our mouth the word of faith which Paul preached. He preached all the counsel of God. He preached the unsearchable riches of Christ. He said that he kept back nothing that was profitable unto them. All that Jesus did in his substitutionary work is the private property of the individual for whom Jesus did it. So throughout our Christian life, God wants us to believe with our heart and say with our lips, all he says we are in Christ. We are not to ignore or neglect our legal standing in Christ, for it is the basis for the acts of faith which puts God to work fulfilling his word in us. We are to confess or whisper in our own heart, in him I am complete. When we know that God in his word says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, we are to believe it and confess it with our lips. Christ will act as our high priest and make it good. We are to confess that Calvary was our emancipation proclamation from everything that is outside the will of God and act accordingly. We are to confess that our sicknesses were laid on Christ and that we are redeemed from the curse of disease. Let him that is weak say, I am strong for the Lord is my strength. Our confession includes the whole of Scripture truth, all that his sacrifice provided, all that his high priesthood covers, 
the whole of God's revealed will. We are to confess that our redemption is complete. Satan's dominion is ended. Calvary has freed us. Like the slaves of the South, we are to believe that we are free on the basis of our Emancipation Proclamation, never on the basis of our feelings or on the evidences of our senses. Remission is the wiping out of everything connected with the old life. We are a new creation. The old things have passed away, and all things are become new. We are to make continual confession of our redemption from Satan's dominion. Of course, we're not to say to others that our healing is fully manifested before it is. God does not say that. But you can say to those who ask you, I'm standing on the word of God. We never rise above our confession. A negative confession will lower us to the level of that confession. It is what we confess with our lips that really controls us. Our confession imprisons us if it is negative or sets us free if it's positive. Many are always telling of their failings and their lack of faith. Invariably, they go to the level of their confession. Confessing a lack of faith increases doubt. Every time you confess doubts and fears, you confess your faith in Satan and deny the ability and grace of God. When you confess doubt, you are imprisoned with your own words. Proverbs 6.2 says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken captive with the words of thy lips. When we doubt his word, it is because we believe something else that is contrary to that word. Wrong confession shuts the Father out and lets Satan in. We are to refuse to have anything to do with wrong confessions. When we realize that we will never rise above our confession, we are getting to the place where God can use us. Disease gains the ascendancy when you confess the testimony of your senses. Feelings and appearances have no place in the realm of faith. Confessing disease is like signing for a package that the express company has delivered. Satan then has the receipt from you showing that you've accepted it. Don't accept anything that Satan brings. Give no place to the devil. 1 Peter 4.11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In Ephesians 4.29, we are commanded to speak only that which is good to the use of edifying. We're not to testify for the adversary. We are to act faith, speak faith, and to think faith. In Philippians 4.8, the Holy Spirit says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, and the word is, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The Holy Spirit says in Proverbs, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, the Holy Spirit says, The weapons of our warfare are mighty, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are to cast down reasonings and give the Word of God its place in our minds and in our lips. We are to have the mind of Christ. Jesus remembers He bore your sicknesses, and the Holy Spirit commands, Forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. God's spiritual and physical transformations are to come to us by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12.1 says, Present your bodies, this is the home or the laboratory of the five senses, a living sacrifice, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A spiritual law that few recognize is that our confession rules us. It is what we confess with our lips that really dominates our inner being. Make your lips do their duty. Refuse to allow them to destroy the effectiveness of God's Word in your case. Some confess with their lips but deny with their heart. They say, yes, the Word is true, but in their heart they say, it is not true in my case. The confession of your lips has no value as long as your heart repudiates it. In the Revised Version, Hebrews 4 verse 14 says, Having then a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. What confession? The confession of our faith in the redemptive work that God wrought in Christ. I am told to hold fast to the confession of the work of Christ in all its phases. 
I'm told to hold fast to the confession that God is the strength of my life. I'm to hold fast to the confession that surely He hath borne my sicknesses and carried my diseases. By His stripes I am healed. God says this, and we are to believe and say the same things. We are to know our rights, as revealed by the Word, and then hold fast to our confession of them. When you know that Christ took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, hold fast to your confession of it. Then you read, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Hold fast to this confession. We are to hold fast to our confession of what Christ has done for us in order that it may be done in us. We are to hold fast to the confession of our redemption from Satan's dominion. We are to hold fast to the confession in the face of all contrary evidence. God declares that by His stripes I am healed. I am to confess what God says about my sickness and hold fast to this confession. I am to recognize the absolute truthfulness of these words in advance of any visible change. I am to act on these words and thank Him for the fact that He laid my sickness on Christ the same as He did my sins. Healing is always in response to faith's testimony. Some fail when things get difficult because they lose their confession. Disease, like sin, is defeated by our confession of the Word. Make your lips do their duty. Fill them with the Word. Make them say what God says about your sickness. Don't allow them to say anything to the contrary. Believing God's word with our heart implies our having put off the old man with his habit of judging by the evidence of the senses. Faith regards all contrary symptoms as lying vanities as Jonah did. It puts the word in the place of the senses. Our only problem is to keep in harmony with God's word and not allow the senses to usurp the place of the word. We cease to live with doubting Thomas who says, Except I see, I shall not believe. We are to prove Christ's own words. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. The word is lifeless until faith is breathed into it on your lips. Then it becomes a supernatural force. Make your lips harmonize with the word of God. Christ's high priestly ministry meets our every need from the moment of our new birth until we enter heaven. Why are we to hold fast our confession? The answer is in Hebrews 4.4, 4, because Christ is the high priest of our confession, because he is a great high priest, because he is a merciful high priest, because he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He is always ready to give us grace to help in the time of need. Our success is assured because Jesus is the high priest of our confession. When you confess that by his stripes I am healed and hold on to your confession, no disease can stand before you. Just thank the Father and praise him whenever a need confronts you that is covered by redemption and it's yours. Faith is thanking God from the heart for healing that has not yet been manifested. We are as sure of it as if it were manifested. The confession of your lips that has grown out of faith in your heart will absolutely defeat the adversary in every combat. Christ's words broke the power of demons and healed the sick. They do the same thing today when we believe and confess them. The word will heal you if you continually confess it. God will make your body obey your confession in his word for Luke 1 verse 37 says, No word of God is void of power. Psalm 34 or 10 says, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. If I dare say that that is true and stand by my confession, God will make good all I have confessed. Nothing will establish you and build your faith as quickly as confession. Confess it in your heart first. Confess it out loud in your room. Say it over and over again. Say it until your spirit and your words agree. Say it until your whole being swings into harmony and into line with the Word of God. Christ's words are filled with Himself. As we act on them, they fill us with Christ. We are to obey the Word as we would obey Jesus if He stood visibly in our presence. When coming to God for salvation in its initial form, and then in every other form afterwards, our confession of and surrender to Christ's Lordship is required. The Holy Spirit says in Colossians 2.6, As ye have therefore received Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him. 
Romans 14.9 says, For this end Christ both died and rose, and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Appropriating faith for the fulfillment of any promise implies our surrender to his lordship. It is while we are surrendered to him as Lord over our lives that he is ready to heal us, to baptize us in the Spirit, to give us his Zoe or his life, God's own life in abundance, to be within us a fountain springing up into everlasting life, to make our legal standing our experience, to manifest his person in the form of every blessing promised to be himself our strength, our portion, our all, to give us the unlimited use of his name, to enable us to cast out demons in his name, to anoint us for preaching, to enable us to lay hands on the sick for their recovery. Your success and usefulness in the world is going to be measured by your confession and by the tenacity with which you hold fast that confession under all circumstances. God can be no bigger in you than you confess Him to be. In the face of every need, confess that the Lord is your shepherd and that you do not want.